Good afternoon and welcome to another A Push video with Mr. Pate for Barlow High School. Today we're looking at the Civil War and our essential question today is what were the turning point battles in the Civil War? We will answer that before we're done with our time so let's get going. At the beginning we have Bull Run. Bull Run is going to take place near Washington DC in Virginia. It is going to be a battle that the northerners are going to go picnicking, the civilians that is, thinking this is going to be a trouncing of the you know, the rebels, and it's going to be a quick ending. Why would they think that? We talked in the last video about all the northern advantages, industry, transportation, communications, population. There are many advantages they have, the Navy, and yet the South has some important ones. They have better trained troops initially. They have uh, better generals, and they are going to win. They route the northern army, and it has to flee and retreat. All the civilians coming picnicking have to flee as well. Bull Run changes expectations. Initially, Lincoln had called up volunteers for a 90-day commitment, and people thought this was going to be fast and be over with. Well, it's not. So they're going to change that and have a lot longer commitment that soldiers are going to have to make. So we move to war in the Eastern Theater. And when we talk about the Eastern Theater, we're talking about largely Maryland, Virginia um, at this time. So what you're going to see in the Eastern Theater is the Peninsula Campaign. Uh, McClellan, the first commanding general of the North, General McClellan, is going to attempt to come down through the Chesapeake, which has all of these kind of inlets, kind of like fingers, and come in and do an amphibious invasion and basically strike in toward Richmond, which is one of the tenets of the Anaconda Plan. The Peninsula Campaign is going to culminate in the Seven Days uh, Battle, and what is going to happen Essentially, even though McClellan is inflicting heavier losses on Lee than he is taking, he's taken 13,000 casualties, Lee 20,000, he gives up and retreats. This is a poor choice. Now, Lincoln was worried about Washington, D.C. being protected, and he was worried um, about the amount of toll of losses he's taking, but not as worried as McClellan. McClellan was grinding him down and in, a, in a ratio that favored him, and yet he's going to abandon this even though he, you know, Lee has far less troops in the South to burn. Um, that sounds harsh, but he can't afford to take troop losses nearly as much as the North can because the North has so much more of a population to draw from. So the Peninsula Campaign ends in kind of a failure, and um, Lincoln is going to replace McClellan, at least temporarily. At the second battle of Bull Run, missing a D there. At the second battle of Bull Run, we're going to see another in what's going to turn into a series of losses in Northern Virginia, to where really Lee is going to become emboldened, and we'll see what happens with that in a little bit. Um, at the second battle of Bull Run, as well as other battles during this time, very early in the war. You see a, you know, a string of successive victories for the South. This emboldens Lee. Now, Lee makes what some people today would say is a great mistake because he is going to decide to attack in the North. Now, the initial Southern strategy was defend the South. Um, if they had dug in in the South and just said, come and get us, uh, the South probably would have been more successful. But Lee thinks... He's so dominant compared to the northern generals that he can afford to make a move. And he goes up into Maryland at the Battle of Antietam. Now, Antietam is a battle that's very significant because Lee is making a big play like Saratoga for the Revolutionary War, if you want a comparison. He's thinking not only Maryland, and Maryland was not super loyal and... Lincoln had declared martial law and was, you know, some people definitely in Maryland were interested in secession. Okay, remember Maryland had slaves. Lee's thinking that he could get a popular up uprising that would lead to Maryland swinging over and becoming a slave state and then that would surround Washington, D.C. He also thinks it would be a decisive victory in the North that would cement a foreign alliance for the South, for the Confederacy. So Antietam has a lot of stakes around it. Um, Lee is going to end up losing partially because someone drops his battle plans and McClellan, who's now been reinstated, is going to be given those. 
So it's a hard fought, very tough battle, but Antietam goes as a battle that's won by the Union. The Confederacy has to retreat. And really, they're on kind of the run. McClellan had a chance to pursue them and, and really inflict a lot of damage on them and hurt that army, the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's army. He does not do that. Lincoln is going to be frustrated and fire him for the second and final time after this. Why does Lee go on the offensive? Well, we just talked about essentially the chance to get foreign intervention if it was a big blow like Saratoga, if uh, he was able to flip Maryland and possibly other border states, or even just create more. Uh, remember, one of the uh, allies of the Confederacy is, are the Copperheads in the North, the, the people who do not want to, you know, you're eventually going to see them called in the election of 1864 Peace Democrats. Some people, uh, they're called Copperheads, they're Southern sympathizers. People who are either saying, we don't want to go to war, just let them go. People who sympathize with the South. Uh, these are disloyal elements that Lincoln is going to battle and he's going to take some unusual measures, uh, suppressing some habeas corpus, declaring martial law, uh, doing what he needs to, seizing disloyal press of Copperheads, jailing some of their leaders and main spokespeople. So you're going to see that Lee is trying to rally these other voices that are anti-war or supportive of the South to his cause to create more conflict in the North because an ununified North would be far less potent of a um, you know, war machine and might not even be able to sustain the war. Okay, the other thing that uh, emerges from Antietam is, of course, it's actually a major victory after, you know, a period of time of not really winning anything. So this gives Lincoln a chance to kind of recast the war. Remember, he came in the whole time as the war is beginning and said, we're going to just preserve the Union, preserve the Union, preserve the Union. He refused, he's very disciplined, stayed on message, did not want to discuss the end of slavery. Well, now, we're, you know, well into the war. Antietam has occurred. Lincoln takes this as a victory. And so he's not declaring an abolition of slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation from a position of weakness, but more of a position of strength. He's not doing it as a desperate symbol as it would be interpreted if they just lost, 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 and then did that. The Emancipation Proclamation, it's important to remember, does not free all the slaves. It did not free the slaves in the border states that stayed loyal the rebel states only. And of course, they don't just get up and leave, so it's more symbolic initially, but it's paving the way to the abolition of slavery, which is important. The war in the West. Okay, so the Battle of Shiloh, which is letter D here, um, we had C was Antietam, B was Second Bull Run, A was Peninsula Campaign, D is Shiloh. It's in western Tennessee. It was significant because it was a step toward getting the Mississippi when the Union wins this. And it also is going to allow the Union to basically cut off the big east-west rail line that the South had. And so between this, uh, you know, kind of taking out western Tennessee and snipping this rail line, that's a very significant battle for the United States that's going to allow the Union to move uh, along some of its other goals. And the next goal is they're going to have an amphibious assault that's going to take out New Orleans. David Farragut is going to successfully capture New Orleans. And now you can see that Western Tennessee and New Orleans are both captured and the Union is going to start working its way uh, toward, each, toward each other with one of their goals of the Anaconda Plan. First was the blockade, second is capture the Mississippi to split the Confederacy, third is capture Virginia. Well, they've already failed on Richmond, Virginia at this point. The blockade is getting better. This is major progress toward one of those goals. New Orleans, Shiloh, so we've handled those. Gettysburg. So this is Lee's last chance. And again, Lee does not stay defensive. He's going to go up, and it's a brilliant idea. He is going to go up into Pence, all the way into Pennsylvania. And again, Maryland's pretty narrow in the western part, but go up there. Um, and the the idea was that not only would this be another a major blow that might help in some ways the South, uh, the Confederate movement and um, momentum, but by looking like he would go toward Philadelphia or New York, he might be able to double down and come to Washington D.C. and you know kind of have like a checkmate move if he captured that. Gettysburg is going to be a very tight battle for three days, very close. 
Eventually, Pickett's charge is going to fail. It's a frontal assault across open ground, and they just get annihilated on the third day. And this really cripples Lee's army. He loses so many troops. As he's forced to retreat then, um, his, he's lost so many men, it's really going to mean that he doesn't ever have the ability to launch another northward um, attack. And he's going to be more in survival mode. And it becomes the, the war in Virginia, then we'll see later on, becomes Grant tracking down Lee and having to capture his army and make him surrender. It's not, you know, I mean, Lee will try and defend important places, but also try and avoid that decisive defeat. Um, later on after the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln will come back, and he has the very short but poignant Gettysburg Address. And he's going to, again, kind of hearken back to Daniel Webster in the Hayne webster debate of 1830, talking about these ideas that had resonated for a generation plus with Americans in the North, this idea that union and liberty and the great experiment of America, it couldn't be allowed to fail. It was such a great thing that the world, you know, a shining light, a beacon for the world, it couldn't be allowed to fail. The union must persevere, must survive. And so again, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation kind of, you know, not only is it going to allow African American troops, which will figure into the last battles in Virginia, but it's going to, it's going to recast what the war is about. The Emancipation Proclamation is going to keep the British out because their population won't stand for it after they say they're going to abolish slavery. Gettysburg Address recasts it in terms of the importance of union and unity. The end of the war in the West. So we have Vicksburg. Well, I already kind of mentioned, we had a little foreshadowing with Shiloh and New, uh, New Orleans that we're moving towards this. Eventually, Grant, who is kind of taking control in the West, he is going to come down and surround and starve out uh, and force the surrender of Vicksburg, Mississippi, on the Mississippi River. This means the whole Mississippi has fallen. The Confederacy has split. Now they've lost this major river. Their railroad has already been split. East-West communications are shut down. And this is going to be a significant loss, a blow to the Confederacy. Lincoln is so impressed. Um, you know, now Meade was who had survived at, at Gettysburg, but he's not as impressive. Um, McClellan's been fired twice. He's done. Other people have been tried as commanding general. It's just not worked out. So uh, the, the generals of the West are Sherman and Grant. Grant is going to be recalled to Virginia by Lincoln. Sherman's going to maintain things in the, in the West. So after Vicksburg you, uh, and the big success there, you, uh, letter G, you get Sherman's March to Sea in Atlanta. Um, Sherman is going to march down from Tennessee, more toward eastern Tennessee, into Georgia, into Atlanta, and eventually surround and capture the town, and then just basically burn everything except people's residences, the Capitol, and the courthouse. Just burns the rest of the town down to nothing. And then Sherman basically says he's going to make Georgia howl. Sherman is going to be executing what the North now calls total war. And total war strategy is you fight the entire society. Now this is not genocide. This does not mean the Northerners shoot on sight every white Southerner. We're not talking about that. But what we are talking about is they're going to take everything away from the Southerners till they give up. And this is really how it's a difference because people thought at the beginning of the war, the Europeans thought South's going to win. Well, the North with total war, really the Civil War in so many ways is the first modern war. You have the railroads, you have telegraphs, you have um, an iron navy, the ironclads coming out. Um, you have new um, advanced weaponry, the, the new rifle muskets are going to be far better than the previous flintlock muskets and it makes it more difficult to do a frontal assault. Trench warfare is going to kind of develop for the first time at, on a limited scale. So you have a lot of things going on where technology is advancing, tactics have to change, um, communications and transportation and industry become so much more of a factor than previous wars that this is the first modern war. And part of that is this total war concept. So after he gets to Atlanta uh, and takes that, Sherman is going to march 50 miles wide, a swath of his soldiers down with very little resistance to Savannah, Georgia on the coast. And he's basically just wrecking everything in his path. He cuts his supply lines. Remember, that was another southern advantage. They thought long supply lines to go down to the south. He just decides to live off his land because there's really not a lot of opposition to him. And what it is, it's like mosquitoes. He can just like blow it away. There's nothing, no army of his size left to challenge him. And after he gets to Savannah, 
He's going to turn northward and, and go up into South Carolina and eventually get all the way up into North Carolina. And as he's going, Sherman, again, he's just, he's living off the land. Uh, he destroys on his way from Atlanta to Savannah 20,000 bales of cotton, captures a bunch more in Savannah, gives them to the Navy. They lived off the livestock. They'd burn homes. Um, they'd strip all the resources out of the homes that there were to take as they went along the way. They're not killing white people. They would also collect all the slaves, and they would follow them and kind of they join Sherman's crew. Okay, <clears throat> not as fighters, but as refugees, essentially. So this takes us to the last thing, Grant's Virginia campaign. Petersburg was a key rail depot and then Appomattox. And what you're going to see is in several locations, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, etc., you're going to see that the um, Union has this total war philosophy. Grant is making, he's making uh, Southern society bend to his will by just, we're going to impose our will and destroy everything to you give up. Okay? Destroy physically, take away everything you have, impoverish you. Okay? But Grant is saying, you know what, I'm just going to grind you down. And people call him the butcher because he's willing, but he's what Lincoln wants. He's willing to sacrifice men because, remember, the tactics of fighting at this time are behind now the technology. Since weapons are more accurate, can shoot from further away, it's more difficult to make a frontal assault and attack an entrenched position. But Grant knows he has more industry. The telegraph is successful during the entire war, helping Lincoln know and his generals coordinate where they're going. They don't have a central nervous system like that in the South. That's a big factor. Lee starts running out of troops. He's running out of um, money because the southern states don't have to give him any. And in the North, you know, there's, they're really getting the war machine and the industrial machine down where the rail cars are taking troops where they need to go. They keep training new troops. African Americans are getting trained now in black regiments. Um, you've got the telegraph and the coordination. And this kind of modern war machine really goes to this fearsome new level that it really had never been used at before anywhere in the world. So Grant is going to take heavy losses, heavier losses often than Lee, but he's going to eventually grind him down and finally kind of get him surrounded, and that leads to Lee's surrender. That's all the time we have for today. Oh, it's not all the time we have for today. First time that's ever happened. The central question was, what were the turning point battles in the Civil War? Antietam would have to be the first one because it prevents the foreign alliance and it allows the Emancipation Proclamation and prevents a southern victory in the north. Second, Vicksburg, can, it takes care of the um, Mississippi River and it, allow, it basically destroys most southern resistance to where after Sherman captures Atlanta, he can just cruise around destroying all opposition in his way with, with really no resistance very much of any significance. The third would have to be Gettysburg where Lee is so tantalizingly close to victory for a while, a victory that really could have reshaped the war, but after it, Lee's battered and crippled and really not capable of attacking into the future. Those would be your three turning point battles. So now, for real, that's all the time we have today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.